It's a story that has been splashed across headlines with shocking new details seemingly around every corner. At a first glance, Lori Vallow seems to be your average loving mother. Photos show a smiling, attractive blonde with two happy all-American children. But behind that cheery smile is a woman with a dark past. A woman who will stop at nothing to hide her frightening secrets. And she's not alone in this. By her side is her new husband, Chad Daybell, a doomsday prepper with a very controversial set of ideals and secrets of his own. Together, this doomsday version of Bonnie and Clyde are now at the center of an investigation that is as complicated as it is captivating. I spoke with the rest of the family who have become a key part of this media firestorm, including JJ's devastated grandparents and Lori's grown son, Colby. It's a family struggling to understand how this could have happened and the details they have to share are downright disturbing and will make you really fear for these two children. We'll also break down the timeline of this ever-evolving investigation. In fact, my team is currently live on the scene of the most dramatic development in the case. More to come on that as we go. Buckle up and get ready for a story that involves dead spouses, an alleged cult, and two missing children. And I'll tell you right now, I'm writing some of these episodes as we go along because this is happening in real time. And as I say, I've got some of my team, I've got investigators on the ground where Lori Vallow is currently being held and refusing to speak. You're listening to a Mother's Secret, The Lori Vallow Story, Mystery and Murder, Analysis by Dr. Phil. I am Dr. Phil. Green Chef is the first USDA-certified organic meal kit company. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from. Love switching it up? Now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real foods that support a healthy lifestyle. You can count on meals that are good for your body. Green Chef offers unique farm-fresh ingredients and premium proteins. The beef tenderloin with tomato shallot sauce. Now this is a restaurant-worthy meal that's guaranteed to wow. The paleo-friendly meal is fantastic and simple to make. Robin and I have fun creating Green Chef meals. It fits perfectly with our diet and lifestyle. So go to greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. The number one meal kit for eating well. The whole reason this story came to light was due to the disappearance of those two cherub cheek children, 17-year-old Tylee and 7-year-old JJ. What happened to these children? Where are they? And could it be their own mother and her husband who had something to do with this? To understand how this case got to where it is today, I'll need to take you inside the couple in question, Lori and her husband, Chad Daybell. Now, they're both like an onion. Just when you think you figured them out, there's another layer. So there is a lot to cover about these two. Now, let me tell you in advance, this family tree is a bit tricky. So let's break down the family tree a bit, and you might have to sketch this out as we're talking about it. We can start with Lori. Now, she is attractive, she is engaging, and she has had quite a colorful time in the romance department. Chad's not her first husband. He's not her second husband. 
No, he's not her third or fourth. He is her fifth husband. Now, before that, her most recent spouse was a man named Charles Vallow. And as it turns out, his fate would not be a pretty one. They had been married since 2006. She came to the marriage with her daughter, Tylee, a daughter from a previous marriage. Charles began raising Tylee as his own. Now, Charles was a former college athlete, an affable guy with a good head for business. Some say that was what drew Lori to him, his financial success. He was divorced and had two sons from his own previous marriage. Now, here's where the family tree gets, well, slightly complicated. In 2012, Charles adopted his sister, Kay's grandchild. Now, Kay's son had been unable to care for the baby boy, and while Kay and her husband Larry loved him, they knew he would have a better home and better care with Charles. So Charles adopted this child named JJ, and he and Lori began raising him alongside Tyler. For many years, life seemed good. By all accounts, Lori was a loving, caring mother. There was laughter in the house, and the children were always cheerful and going on one adventure after another. A church was very important to the family. They belonged to the Mormon Church of Latter-day Saints and were very much a part of that community. For a time, the family moved to the island of Kauai in Hawaii, eventually relocating to Phoenix, Arizona for Charles' business. But this happiness, well, this was not to last. Before long, deep cracks started to appear. And it all started when Lori met doomsday prepper Chad Daybell at a local convention. They hit it off. And their relationship seemed harmless enough at least at first. After all, they were both married, and they were at this convention together because they had some common interests, some common curiosities at least. Lori decided she wanted to start appearing on a podcast alongside Chad. Now, this podcast was called Preparing a People Podcast Network's Time to Warrior Up. The subject of this podcast was having guests appear to talk about the end of the world. That's right, the end of the world and how to prepare for it. Given the current state of affairs, plenty of podcasts and online forums exist where people can talk and plan for the end of days. An intense subject matter for sure, but things would soon become even more strange. Only a couple of months after Lori started associating with Chad and became involved with the podcast, Charles filed for divorce. Now, remember, they've been married for a while now, and the theory a lot of people held, they weren't so bold as to call her a gold digger, but they did say one of the things that fascinated her about Charles was his success. She was infatuated with, mesmerized with the fact that he was good at what he did and was financially successful. And they had agreed to take in this child. So they have two children and then seemingly abruptly, Charles filed for divorce. Now, his allegations were troubling, troubling to say the least. He claimed that she was having visions and believed herself to be the second coming of Christ. He also alleged that his wife had threatened to kill him if he stood in the way of her completing that mission. Charles confided quite a bit in his sister Kay during that time, and there was more. 
He told Kay that Lori had told him that she was put on earth to save 144,000 people from the end of the world, which was coming specifically on July 22nd, 2020. That's pretty precise. She considered herself to be one of the blessed 144,000 and that she had a ticket straight to heaven. Lori was certainly sharing some beliefs that shocked others. Her good friend April was positively floored by what she was hearing. So, of course, Charles, at this point, you might be wondering why he didn't just say, okay, she's delusional. She's having visions. So, if you look at this from a mental health perspective, you would consider those to be visual hallucinations. She considers herself to be the second coming of Christ, so you would consider that to be ideas of reference, delusions of grandeur. So you would start thinking, okay, this is psychosis, and very likely some type of schizophrenic process. And generally what a spouse does in this situation is seek help, psychological or psychiatric help for their partner, not to file for divorce. So was there more to the story? Because as we said, Charles is an affable guy. And so you've got children and a successful, affable guy. He's certainly not someone that would not be aware of alternatives here. This told me right away, there's something more going on here than just that. You have to put this against the backdrop of her actually getting involved in a podcast about the end of the world. And there are some inconsistencies here because she's telling Kay that she's one of the 144,000, she's telling him that she's the second coming of Christ. I would think if you're the second coming of Christ, you wouldn't need to take up a seat on the bus that's got 144,000 seats. You might be driving the bus or floating along beside it, but I wouldn't think you would need to be one of the 144,000. So that seems to me to be inconsistent. And when you're dealing with schizophrenics and they have a delusion such as that, it's usually very well entrenched and very consistent. And if you don't think so, just try to penetrate that delusion and see how far you get. During their separation, she began accusing Charles of being violent and verbally abusive. Now, Again, this just didn't seem like affable Charles at all. Everyone who knew him remarked how patient he was. He didn't want a divorce. He just no longer knew what to do with his wife, who was expressing such radical beliefs and showing such radical behavior. And when I say radical behavior, if anybody challenged her beliefs, if anyone questioned what she was saying, She wasn't the warm and smiling, tan blonde that you would see in the pictures that were sprinkled around the house. She got very combative. Her thoughts weren't just radical, they were alarming. On one occasion, she told her friend, April, that Charles was already dead and that there was a demon living inside him. Now, that's a whole other level of possession, that his body is dead and a demon is living inside him. This is Weekend at Bernie's at a whole other level. But then Lori changed her story, saying that Charles, well, was actually still alive, but she knew he would die soon. Let that sink in. She's had these delusions of grandeur that she's a second coming of Christ, so 
when she predicts something, she thinks that she might be stating a prophecy. That makes it terrifying when she gives a pronouncement that she knows he will die soon. Well, April didn't know what to think now, except that something was very, very wrong. As far as Charles was concerned, his wife was like a stranger who had gone completely off the deep end. He told loved ones that she was threatening to murder him and then have angels dispose of his body. Excuse me? It's just outrageous to me that these children remained in her custody with the type of things that she was saying. So when I said that I thought there was more going on than just her having some unusual thoughts, we don't know everything that was going on, but we do know that he was really concerned. And I know, having been trained as a forensic psychologist, that he had a duty to protect these children. Make no mistake, failing to get your children out of harm's way, failing to remove your children from a situation where a person that is involved that could hurt your children is unstable enough that they could be explosive or unpredictable and could hurt your children, Failing to remove those children from that situation is negligence. And negligence is abuse. And what is going through my head as I was watching this unfold, and as I'm looking at it historically, was why he wouldn't step up and remove those children from that situation at the time. Now, you're probably thinking that's easy for you to say now that you know that these children are missing, but if you know me, you know that I have said this in many a situation. I even have giant graphics built of the definition of negligence, including failure to remove a child from an explosive or violent spouse, or parent. Let's just suffice it to say, this certainly was no longer a marriage made in heaven. However, Charles halted his filing in the middle of proceedings. He just quit. He had filed it. He was serious about it. And then in the middle of it, he just stopped the proceedings, claiming that he wanted to try to make things work. Well, You know the old saying, love is blind. I guess sometimes love is foolish as well. Even stranger, there was a period of time during the divorce when Lori went completely AWOL. The same month that Charles filed for divorce, she skipped town. Now, she still has two children, understand. She just left them with others and off she went. Not only that, but he soon discovered that she had withdrawn $35,000 from their family bank account. He feared she was giving this money to her new group of like-minded friends, which, there's no mincing words here, he thought she was getting involved in a cult. He didn't think this was a group of enthusiasts or hobbyists. He thought this was a cult. and. Now, we don't have confirmation that Lori and Chad were in a cult or were leading a cult. So we just have to say alleged cult, religious group, and let you decide whether or not you think it's a cult. Because I can't say whether it's a cult or not. But there are some signs as described by a leading expert and interventionist that works with cults and people that are involved in cults. His name is Rick Ross, and he has some red flag warning signs that you look for. And one is a zero tolerance policy for questions or critical thinking when it comes to beliefs. 
if you question anything, you're viewed as a threat. Now, think about why that's important. You think about cults that get to a certain point where they ask members to do something really radical. And I guess the ultimate is Jonestown with Jim Jones. That's where the saying, drink the Kool-Aid, came from. He got a couple of hundred people to drink some poisonous Kool-Aid and commit mass suicide because they were so indoctrinated to the beliefs that they thought they were going to be meeting some horrible fate if they didn't escape into the hereafter. And a lot of them didn't question. A lot of them did, but there were men standing around with high-powered weapons making sure they followed their beliefs. Think about the group with the Hale Bob Comet. They're involved in that situation. This is the one where they all got brand new tennis shoes and then committed suicide. There's no room to question that. There's like eight or ten guys there. You have to think if they allow free thinking, they're handing out new tennis shoes and everybody's saying, okay, yeah, I, I'm good with this. Okay, give me a new pair of tennis shoes. And then they say, okay, now you got to kill yourself. Well, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> what? If you have somebody that's free thinking, they're okay with the tennis shoes, not so okay with killing themselves so they can get in the tail of a comet. You can't allow free thinking in a cult. It's a threat. The next red flag is unreasonable fear about the outside world, such as impending catastrophe, evil conspiracies, and persecutions. This pretty much fits this group run by Chad Daybell to a T. And the key thing, the group leader is the exclusive means of knowing truth or receiving validation. No other process of discovery is really acceptable or credible. This is exemplified by Chad claiming to be this holy, powerful man who has been ordained by God. In a cult, a leader will set themselves up as the gatekeeper, the path, the one person that you turn to. They have the power. They have been anointed. Everything runs through them money, power, property, whatever, it all runs through them. They are the truth tellers. So there's a zero tolerance policy for questions or critical thinking. They instill a fear on anybody outside the group. It's them and us. It's us against the world. And then there is a leader that is the power really takes the place of God. Now, as if this wasn't causing enough dysfunction within the family, you also have to think of the impact of the ongoing separation for the children here and the impact it must have had on them during this time, especially considering the type of beliefs that Lori was spewing. At this point, it's tough to say exactly what was going on in Lori's mind. I mean, we know what she's saying. She was displaying unstable emotions. She was talking about being the second coming of Christ. She was talking about the end of the world. She was talking about visions, delusional beliefs. And then you add on top of that this pending divorce. The mental health of these children was just taking a beating. Children look to the marriage as their base of operations, their foundation. That's what they rely on for their self-esteem. That's what they rely on for their confidence in the world. That's their base of operations, their foundation of security. And if that is threatened every day, they don't know if it's going to blow up, come apart, fall apart. Then they live with anxiety, fear, depression. And we know that when that happens, they become at risk 
for depression, suicide, drugs, alcohol, being marginalized, underachieving in school. I wrote a book about this kind of thing called Family First, Your Step-by-Step Plan for Creating a Phenomenal Family. And I talk about what children need when they're going through the tumultuous times of a divorce, and they need acceptance. That's the first thing. They need to know that they are loved. You are divorcing their partner, not them. And in this case, it obviously was a poor decision for Lori to just up and leave town for whatever reason, because that gave them the message, you are abandoning us. It's not just that you two parents are splitting up. We're getting dropped as well. The second thing they have a great need for is assurance of safety. They need to feel protected during this trying time. They need to know that their world is predictable and it's not going to fall apart. They need freedom from guilt or blame. Children often take on blame during a divorce, and this can really be exacerbated when the divorce is toxic. They tend to shoulder the burden of their parents' actions. And in addition, I've always cautioned parents not to burden their children with situations that are out of their control, not to drag them into adult issues. Now, these things that I've just talked about, children needing acceptance, assurance of safety, freedom from guilt and blame, and not being burdened with adult issues, Those are things children always need, but they're really magnified during a time of divorce. So even though Charles is scared out of his wits about Lori's new preoccupation with preparing for the end of the world, he's decided he wants to give their relationship another go, which means these children are going to be subjected to more turmoil. However, More was coming to light regarding Lori's alarming new interest. They were starting to even impact her extended family. Because in June, Lori's niece, Melanie, filed for divorce. Her husband, Brandon, was convinced it was because she had joined her Aunt Lori in a doomsday cult. He was shocked because he thought they had a good marriage. He was unaware there were problems. Then all of a sudden, she ties in with Aunt Lori and files for divorce. Now, Brandon is claiming that his wife was coming out of the blue with newfangled ideas that shocked him and made them, in her words, no longer a fit. She apparently had outgrown him. She had become much more sophisticated, much more in tune with the universe. Now, at this point, we have a wife and mother who has all of a sudden started espousing wild beliefs and a niece whose husband claims that both are now part of a very dangerous group. If this sounds like a recipe for disaster to you, um, I think you'd be right. The first death in this family would soon occur because on July 11th, according to Lori and her daughter, Tylee, Charles came to Lori's house to pick up their son and the couple ended up getting in a fight. Now, this is when things really spin out of control. Lori's brother, Alex, is there and he gets involved. First in a verbal argument with Charles that reportedly gets physical. Before long, supposedly things escalated to the point that Alex ended up shooting Charles, putting two bullet holes in his chest. Now, this is affable Charles and things get to the point that Alex has to get a gun and shoot him twice in the chest. Let's take a listen to the 911 call 
from this harrowing day. The man's voice you hear is Lori's brother, Alex Cox. He's the trigger man. 911, where is your emergency? You need yes. police or paramedics? Uh, both. I'm in police and an ambulance. What's the emergency there? Uh, there was a, I got in a fight with my brother-in-law and I shot him in self-defense. And is he hurt or is he alive or? Yeah, there's blood. He's, he's not moving. They then transferred Alex to the medic. Okay, what part of his body is injured? Uh, in the chest. I'm sorry, where? In the chest. Okay, is he awake and responsive or unconscious? Unconscious. Okay, is he breathing? I can't tell. Are you willing to go over to him and check? Sure. Okay, do you just let me know if you see his chest going up and down? How old is he? It's not moving. He's 60. Okay, and are you wanting to start CPR? No, I don't know how to do that. I can walk you through it. Okay. She proceeds to try and coach him through the CPR process to no avail. She's also trying to ask him questions as this goes on. Hey, were you guys arguing when this happened? Yeah. Okay. He, he came at me with a bat. drinking or doing drugs or anything today, you know? I, I don't know, but I've never seen him that enraged before. He's not responding at all. Can you come out, walk outside with your hands empty? Sure. Are you able to do that with your hands sure. up and empty? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but he sounds oddly calm. I've never shot anyone but I've listened to an awful lot of 911 tapes where people have called in that have shot someone. This one sticks out like a sore thumb. And notice that he wasn't exactly jumping to save his brother-in-law. He didn't even want to do CPR at first. The operator had to encourage him by telling him that she would help him through it. Now, while this case is still open, investigators initially ruled it as self-defense. Right from the get-go, police found holes in this story. First of all, Alex said he had been alone. But then Lori and Tylee claimed to have been there during the altercation. There are not versions of the truth. And this is a macro fact. You're either alone or you're not. This isn't a matter of opinion or perspective. You're either alone or you're not. We also have to talk about Lori's demeanor during this initial talk with police. She said she dropped J.J. off at school. She now returned back to the family home with Tylee in tow. Tylee is her daughter. As she's finding out that her brother has shot and killed her estranged husband, she's cool as a cucumber. She's making small talk with officers. She's giggling. You heard me right. She's giggling. Police officers, well, they just couldn't believe how composed Alex and Lori were. It was like, being with the blonde version of the Adams family. Lori was showing no reaction that her husband was now dead. And think back, it had just been a short time that she had made the pronouncement, the prophecy that he actually wasn't dead with a demon using his body, but that he would soon be dead. How prophetic. Because here we are, and he's dead. Maybe that's why she wasn't upset, because she wasn't surprised. According to Tylee and Lori, there was an argument that ended up involving the three adults. Tylee told police that she picked up the bat to defend her mother, Lori and that her stepfather Charles then took the bat and took a swing at her uncle Alex. 
Alex claimed that after Charles hit him in the head with a baseball bat, he ran into the room he had been sleeping in, retrieved a shotgun, and shot Charles in self-defense. It's interesting to note that although Alex claimed to have been hit with a baseball bat, there was only a small amount of blood coming from a cut on his head. That doesn't exactly match with the idea of getting hit in the head by an angry man with a baseball bat. I suppose he could have just clipped him with the bat, a glancing blow, but you would expect that it would be a more crushing blow if it was serious enough that he would go and get a gun. He said it was self-defense. Now, he left the room to get a gun. That means that room had a door on it. And if he went in the room to get a gun, why not just shut the door? And now you're no longer in imminent danger. You're not even in the same room. And I'm really curious how this was initially, at least, ruled self-defense when there was an exit corridor. We know there was an exit corridor because he says he left the room to go get a gun and come back in the room and shoot the man twice in the chest. I'm not a lawyer, but I've spent a lot of time in the courtroom as a trial scientist and to claim self-defense, you have to have a state of mind, a belief in your mind that your life is in imminent danger, right now danger. And he left the room where he could close a door. That, to me, defeats imminent danger. The police definitely saw holes in this story. And despite their gut feelings, for the time being, police treated Charles' death as a case of self-defense. But this won't be the last we hear about Charles and his untimely death. Now, I've been doing this for over 45 years, this being working with human functioning in every way, individually, couples, families. It's a pretty broad lane. Everybody has a family. Everybody comes from a family or are in a family, and I have met with families that exhibit all kinds of dysfunction. In this case, things just went from bad to worse. You want to shield your children from conflict, not pull them into it. And here, we've had all of this turmoil, all of this chaos in this family. We've got daughter Tylee right there for this conflict and the killing or murder of Charles. Wow. Very traumatic for anyone to see someone else standing right next to them, get shot and killed. So what's she living with? Her mother has just gone AWOL, disappeared for a month. They filed for divorce. Her mother has told her she's the second coming of Christ. She's in an organization, an alleged cult, certainly a very intense group of people that are preparing for the end of the world. There's unpredictability, fear, violence, and Lori is expressing some radical ideas, and it seemed like she had been running the show. Well, she damn sure is now. She, in a matter of seconds, became a single mom. Now, grief can impact people in all sorts of ways, so... Maybe Lori was in shock and was acting unruffled because she was just numb. But it was just odd. Lori wasn't behaving as if this bothered her one bit. She wasn't acting like a zombie. 
She was every bit as even keeled as her brother Alex had been after he had just shot her husband dead and made that eerily calm 911 call. Take, for example, the manner in which she told her husband Charles' biological sons that their father was now dead. Instead of a phone call, she sent them a text message, and I'm going to read it to you. Here's what it said. Hi, boys. I have very sad news. Your dad passed away yesterday. I'm working on making arrangements, and I'll keep you informed with what's going on. I'm still not sure how to handle things. Just want you to know that I love you, and so did your dad. Can you imagine you're sitting somewhere at work, at lunch, in your car, your phone buzzes, you got a text message, you pick it up, and someone has texted you that your father is dead? And they don't bother to tell you how. Can you imagine getting informed in this way from your stepmother that her husband, your father, is dead? No details. And she signs off with two exclamation points and a heart emoji at the end. It just defies logic. According to the sons, of course they called and texted her to find out what happened. They say she did not respond for hours, and when she did, she just was not at all forthcoming about the circumstances of his death. It was as though she wasn't even trying to hide the fact that she was a very merry widow. The same day after her brother shot and killed her husband, neighbors heard loud music coming from the family's backyard. Why? Lori was having a pool party. No, you didn't hear me wrong. Lori was having a pool party. So what's next? She's going to go tap dance on his grave? This was beyond strange. Uh, Look, I'm the first one to say people grieve in different ways. They do. Some people grieve quickly, some people grieve more slowly, some people cry, some people don't cry. But this isn't really about grief here. This is about respect. This is about being a role model for your children. This is about what message you send to people that love the deceased. And when he has died a violent death, And when your family member, your brother, self-defense or otherwise, has shot him dead, you don't go have a pool party. It looks as though she was celebrating, not grieving. What would she be celebrating? I don't know. That she was free to pursue a blossoming romance with Chad Daybell? Chad Daybell is as much a part of this story as Lori. He's a charismatic man who knows how to work a room. He has that nice, harmless dad at a soccer game look. However, like Lori, there is much more to this guy than meets the eye. Not only is he a doomsday prepper and allegedly the leader of this group, he's also the author of several doomsday novels. More on that later. Chad has always been a well-liked guy and had done a lot of missionary work as a practicing Mormon, but somewhere along the way, he had become obsessed with this notion of the second coming. More than that, he believed that he had special powers, including the ability to have one foot on earth and one in the spirit world. He had had near-death experiences, he said, and he had been enlightened. Lori just found that fascinating, and she found him brilliant. Now, plenty of others found Chad to be, at best, quirky, unconventional, and at worst, dangerous and unpredictable in his beliefs. Lori and Chad were growing increasingly close, and their attraction and bond was obvious even prior to her husband Charles being shot dead, 
Lori was living in Arizona at the time, but would make trips to Idaho to spend time with Chad and to appear on the podcast. Those close to the situation claimed she revered him and his philosophies. Only two months after Lori's husband is shot dead, she left Arizona and moved to Rexburg, Idaho with Tylee and JJ to start anew. Again, all of this is happening within the span of a few months, eight weeks. This has got to be stressful for these children. Their stepfather, Charles, is dead. They've now moved, and their mother seemingly has already set her sights on a new man, who, by the way, just happens to be all about the end of the world. Here is where Tylee and JJ's story takes an even more drastic turn. In early September, Lori enrolled seven-year-old JJ in a local elementary school in Rexburg. Yet, curiously, by the end of September, she withdrew him, saying she was going to homeschool the child. Meanwhile, Tylee wasn't enrolled anywhere at the time, as her family said she had graduated early. So now, you have two children who are pretty much off the radar, and they're relying on two people who are allegedly spiraling down a very dark hole of conspiracy theories, paranoia, visions, delusions, and obsessed with the end of the world. Keep in mind, Chad and Lori are growing closer, but he's still married to a woman named Tammy, and they have five children. So he's very much unavailable romantically, at least in the eyes of the law. Well, I hope you're sitting down. As fate would have it, he would soon become a single man, and Lori would be ready and waiting. How would this happen so quickly? Divorces take time. By now, September's over, it's early October, and Chad's wife, Tammy, was about to get the fright of her life. It was a bizarre encounter. Tammy called 911, saying a man in a mask attempted to take a shot at her with a paintball gun. She had no idea why. She even wrote about this jarring experience on Facebook, trying to make sense of it. Who would do such a thing? Who goes around shooting at people with paintball guns. Anyway, this is what she wrote on her Facebook page. Quote, Something really weird just happened, and I want you to know so you can watch out. I had gotten home and parked in our front driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad, and he ran off around the back of my house. I have no idea what his motive was, and he never spoke, even after I asked him several times what he thought he was doing. I was about to smack him with my freezer meals when I decided to yell for Chad instead. End of quote. When police came to Chad and Tammy's family home, they spoke with them both and ultimately believed it to be the work of a prankster. Odd for a prankster to go around at night in a mask, but nevertheless, all seemed well until 10 days later, because 10 days later, there was yet another dramatic 911 call to be made. Her family said that Tammy had died in her sleep at their home. Chad claimed he had no idea what had happened, and investigators initially ruled the death as natural. Let's take a minute to get organized here and go back to the timeline. In July, Lori's husband is shot dead. In August, late August, early September, Lori moves to Rexburg, Idaho. Reports are that she and Chad are getting very close. But he's not available, at least not in the eyes of the law, because he's still married. Mid-October, Chad's wife Tammy is dead. He's now available. 
Within mere weeks of Tammy's death, guess what happened? Wedding bells are ringing for Lori and Chad. So Lori's married, and her husband gets shot dead. Chad's married. His wife just dies in her sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. and Mrs. Daybell. Coincidence? Could be. Nobody's been charged or arrested for any wrongdoing. Just because all this death and drama seem like plotline too zany for even most outlandish daytime soap operas, that didn't mean it wasn't all just happening coincidentally, naturally. And let me emphasize again, Charles' death was ruled self-defense. Tammy's death was ruled natural causes. Neither Lori nor Chad have been named persons of interest. They have not been named as suspects. They certainly haven't been charged. So there is not one thing that you could point to other than some unusual timing that would raise an eyebrow. However, it's your eyebrow. Chad and Lori were on the same page. It seemed as though destiny had brought them together and perhaps a happy ending was in the cards. But perhaps not. The worst was yet to come. According to investigators, these children hadn't been seen since September. One of Tylee's friends said she had received a short cryptic text in late October from her reading, quote, Hi, miss you guys too. Love you. This is a 17-year-old girl. Now, most 17-year-old teenage girls keep in constant contact with others. They're texting. They're on social media. They're just buzzing back and forth. They leave an electronic footprint. And what teenager doesn't? Well, the answer to that question is one who can't. One who can't because they're gone. When I spoke with Lori's son, Colby, he described their last communication as, well, he just said it was off. Here's a text exchange between you and Tylee's phone number, at least. And this was on September 28th of 19, which would be like four weeks after you last saw them on FaceTime. And Colby, you say, hey, Ty, happy birthday. I'm so proud of you. I know you have been through a lot. Trust God, it's all going to be okay. Then Tylee says, thanks, Colbs. I love you. She's usually using emojis. So that's kind of the one thing that you can already tell. Like, okay. it seems, and it's really quick response. And so you say, hey, Ty, are you okay? She says, I'm good, just tired. Um, call you back later. Love you. Um, and you say, okay, <clears throat> call me tonight, please. At the movie, I'll call you after. And you say, Ty, please call me after your movie. I'm worried about you. And she says, worried about me? What? Uh, I just want to hear you talk. Okay, this week was just busy. I'll call you soon. And you're saying this is not the kind of banter you have with her. Yeah, and the fact that this week is busy, like what does that have to do with right now? And I just tried to push her a little bit just to get her to call me. It didn't seem like a difficult task. It was so like, you know, push me away. Every time I asked her to call me, just push it to the side. I'm busy, and that doesn't make sense. He knew this was out of character and that something was up. And here's what he had to say about his mom's relationship with his stepsister, Tylee. And how did she get along with your mother? They had a really complicated relationship and they just fought a lot and they had kind of that back and forth. Tylee's really strong-willed. She's always done things basically the way that she would want to do it. She doesn't get pushed into things and she just has always known how to take care of herself and take care of JJ too. So what would her likely reaction be if she felt that there was a threat? Would she have taken him and gone into hiding? 
I really hope so. So Tylee was known as strong-willed and protective of JJ. If something was going on that she didn't approve of, she might try to stand up to her parents. Did that strong will of hers put her in harm's way? On November 26, Rexburg police were called by JJ's grandma and grandpa, Kay and Larry, requesting that a welfare check be done on JJ. They hadn't spoken with the boy in months and they were beyond concerned. Of course, police went to the newlyweds' townhome to check on him. There was no sign. When they questioned the Daybells, they had an explanation. He was fine and staying with a friend in Arizona. Police suspected this was a lie, and sure enough, when they looked into it, they determined that he had never been staying with who the Daybells said. Police sprang into action. The very next morning, police returned to Chad and Lori's condo to serve them with a search warrant. Well, guess what? They were gone. There was no trace of them, and more importantly, no trace of Lori's children, Tylee and J.J. Where were they? They just disappeared. Chad and Lori had just disappeared. They were there one day. When they go back the next, they're just gone. And the real question is, where are these children? On our next episode, we'll talk to J.J.'s grandparents. There's even more death, more death, and more mystery to come. We've covered a lot, but believe me when I tell you this is just the tip of the iceberg in the case of Lori Vallow and her missing children. You've been listening to A Mother's Secret, The Lori Vallow Story, Mystery and Murder, Analysis by Dr. Phil. I'm Dr. Phil.